Our next guest wrote a striking and I think important piece recently for Teen Vogue magazine entitled How the School to Prison Pipeline Works and Why Black Girls Are Especially at Risk. Uh, I wanted to talk to her and learn more about it, so she joins us now. Mariam Kaba is a New York-based organizer, educator, and curator. She's the founder of Project NIA, and she works on uh, anti-violence initiatives, dismantling the prison industrial comp uh, con complex, excuse me, and related issues as well. So first of all, Miriam, thank you so much for joining us. Sure, thanks for having me. Uh, secondly, uh, what was the inspiration for you to write this piece on uh, the School of Prison Pipeline and what's been happening to, to black girls? Yeah, um, this month, uh, October, is uh, National Youth Justice Awareness Month. Um, and so Teen Vogue has dedicated the month to a series of articles that are focused on um, trying to have their readers uh, understand the criminalization of young people um, at various levels and different entry points within the criminal punishment system. So um, I was invited to uh, write something as part of the month-long series that they're hosting. And uh, I chose to focus on um, the school-to-prison pipeline with a focus particularly on girls and young women and even more specifically on black girls, uh, mainly because I think when that conversation happens, if it happens at all, it's usually focused on the plight of black boys. And so I just wanted to take a different angle. Yeah, and I think that was a very important one and one that deserves more at uh, attention. And you know, for those listeners who might not know what the school to prison pipeline is, uh, my understanding is that's when uh, kids, particularly uh, minority kids, black kids, are singled out for excessive punishment, disciplinary actions, and so on in school. Studies have shown that that uh, often leads to increased rates of incarceration and so on. Am I right about that, first of all? Um, yeah, so it's less of a pipeline and more of a swamp, I think. Um, it's more of kind of exactly as you described, kind of how the harsh disciplinary policies and law enforcement policies interact together to push kids out of uh, school um, and into uh, being dropouts. And it's the correlation between dropping out from school and incarceration uh, that is where the nexus around the prison part of the uh, pipeline or swamp happens. Um, so yeah, and I think the other point that I didn't bring up in the article, but is also part of the push out is often the curriculum in schools um, is not very engaging to students because of the uh, kind of test prep uh, accountability, quote unquote, measures that have come into the neoliberal space um, in, of schooling um, that also contributes to the push out of young people. Yeah, I think that's a great point, Miriam. I, I, I think that one of the things that happens with our educational system is the, there was a, the philosopher John Dewey, the education philosopher in, uh, in the 19th century, said education should be the lighting of a fire, not the filling of a pail. But we, we treat our kids, and I think particularly kids in underfunded schools and inner city schools and so on, as if they're just receptacles for information they're, they're right. supposed to be fed to them, and then they go out, and if they're lucky, they got to get a job working for the corporate system, and if they're unlucky, well, that's their problem. And I think that's not a way to engage people, uh, young people, and lead them on the path to a meaningful life, right? I That's exactly correct, and I think it's not the... Think about yourself as a person who's an adult, you know, if something is incredibly boring and irrelevant to you, are you likely to want to learn about it? No, you're not. Um, and so we kind of dim uh, the curiosity of young people um, and by giving them things that have no relevance to what they care about and that are incredibly boring and that are teaching to a test that makes no sense to them. So absolutely, I would agree. Yeah, I've been in schools as an adult that just seemed, they seemed like you were already in prison sometimes to go. Yeah. You know, you got to go. That's right. 
you, you go through a metal detector, especially if it's an inner city school, there's, be, there's discipline, there are bells ringing, go here, go there, sit, be quiet, listen to that. Uh, so I know exactly what you're saying. And so, so. Yeah. I think the other point, I mean, it's important to make the distinction that schools are in fact not prisons, but what many schools do is prep young people for prison. Um, and that's the, the important thing to keep in mind. So, and by that, and again, we're talking with Mariam Cobb about her piece on the school to prison pipeline, especially for young black girls. Uh, so by that, do you mean, uh, you know, don't have autonomy, don't think for yourself? Uh, uh, what exactly do you mean by that? Yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, uh, there's a piece by a, a sociologist named Paul Hirschfield called Prison Prep, which uh, is a uh, kind of academic article where he basically makes the case that the ways in which schools often try to instigate, you know, in, uh, in institutionalize routine um, and, again, boring and irrelevant curricula, uh, the punishment um, that young people experience if they go anywhere outside of the, quote, norm um, that is imposed by a set of very strict rules within schools. All of that punishment and kind of keeping you in check is a preparation for often getting into situations where you are in a correctional facility uh, environment. So that's kind of what he points to. He also makes the larger points about uh, the ways in which our kind of underfunding and disinvestment um, from schools also is a feeder uh, because, again, it helps push young people out of school into the prison system. And by the way, as you said that about underfunding our, our particularly our inner city schools, I couldn't help but think of Chicago Mayor Rahm Emanuel, who's been uh, yeah. one of the nation's leaders in doing that. In as far as I know, uh, you, you, your piece for Teen Vogue uh, cited a lot of excellent reports, was filled with information. You, you mentioned that overall black students of all genders are disproportionately disciplined in school, although they don't actually misbehave more than their peers. And you also point out that over the last 15 years, uh, black girls in particular have been increasingly subjected to harsh disciplinary policies. And you point to a report from the Black Women's Justice Institute. Uh, it's really shocking and disturbing to see that. And that, for example, in the 2013 to 14 school years, black girls were more than six times more likely than white girls to receive a, a suspension, an out of school suspension. So uh, do, do you have any sense of why that is? Is that because we're viewing black girls differently in modern society. Well, what is going on that this is getting even worse instead of better? Right. Yeah. It it, it very much has to do with the trajectory of uh, becoming an increasingly punitive country overall. Um, you know, we had a period of time, particularly during the 80s and 90s, where our uh, elected officials at all local you know, state and federal level, began to pass a whole series of zero tolerance like three strikes you're out, uh, you know, mandatory minimum kinds of, uh, of laws in the, in the criminal punishment realm that seeped in to our other parts of the partial state, which include schools, which include welfare offices, which include hospitals, which include all these different institutions that people often turn to as spaces for help. Um, the, you know, that punitive mindset has infused that. And when you think about race and gender, racialized gender issues, you think about girls, they're particularly criminalized because we see girls, particularly black girls, as less innocent and more adult-like than white girls. And, you know, the, the idea that black girls are not really children. Um, so therefore, if you're going to punish people, you're more likely to punish people who you think can, quote, handle it. Um, there's that cultural script that exists. Um, we also see black girls as much more aggressive and disrespectful. I think everybody can see that because, you've, you know, we've all internalized in this culture anti-blackness. And so even when we see black girls in public spaces, often being just having fun, enjoying themselves with their uh, with their friends, they often are perceived as more 
threatening, as loud, as obnoxious in a way that white girls are not. Um, and so that carries through mm. uh, into the schools and the, in the punishment that girls are, that's meted out against them within schools if they even, you know, fall out of line for a minute or speak back or ask a question in a way that a, a teacher doesn't feel is respectful or an administrator isn't feeling is respectful. And then the other thing is that uh, because black girls attend schools with a lot fewer resources that are not like counselors and other things like that, they overwhelmingly cops are in those schools. And what do, what is the job of police? The job of police is to arrest people. It's not to be a counselor. Um, and so, you know, if you already have a criminalized setting within your school, you're more likely to then be arrested and put in through the system because you already have those things in your school. Um, so those are two things that are critical and important to keep in mind. And, you know, I, I, you use the phrase anti-blackness, which, you know, I think is important to highlight, too, because as you were going through this description of these statistics about people being more likely to see black girls as adult-like than their white peers, more likely to see them as, you know, aggressive and disrespectful and so on, I was thinking to myself, well, isn't that racist? I mean, mm -hmm. isn't that seeing a class of children differently based on their identity? Uh, am, am right. I, isn't that right? Sure. Uh, well, absolutely. But I mean, I think your listeners will be familiar with this, right? That, for example, every time a young black person, if it's a young black boy, uh, is killed by the police, right? You've seen the media responses to those young black boys. They're not seen as boys. They're always talked about as men, uh, even if they're, you know, Tamir Rice's age, like mm -hmm. 12 years old. They are always seen as, quote, what was the famous New York Times uh, piece when uh, Mike Brown was killed in Ferguson right. in 2014? The, the article was, he's no angel, right? So the, the way that... Um, that black children are portrayed within the media re is not like actually it's a it's a reinforcing thing right it's that the culture thinks of them that way the media responds in that way and it's a vicious cycle that continues so they're not given the opportunity to have the same level of empathy that a white person or a white kid that does something gets automatically by virtue of their whiteness. And so you see that on a regular basis. If this even extends to adults, right? Um, think about the current person who uh, mowed down and killed almost 60 people in Las Vegas. And the immediate response was to ask the question, what was wrong? for this man mentally like what would make him do something like this and the all the articles were about what a how what a shock this was to everybody and how he liked to play poker like we got humanizing details about this person right who killed mo the most people in modern history in the u.s and injured like 600 other people, right? If any, if an 18 year old black girl or 18 year old black boy had done this exact thing, please think about what the coverage would have been like. What kind of discussion would we be having? We'd be talking about the cult pathology of blackness that led these kids into that. We'd be talking about the pathology of poverty that led them, you know? So the, the language, the discussion, the way we think, we're hardwired to be anti-black. We're out, we're really a hardwired. It's, it's, it takes effort for people to move beyond that and be like, no, I'm just going to actually look at what happened in the circumstances and make a conversation and discussion about that. Yeah, yeah. No, I think you're absolutely right. And, and the comparison with the press coverage of uh, the violence of someone like uh, Stephen Paddock or whatever his name was is, is a perfect example of that. Now, uh, people can, I believe, do something about it. I read in your articles the Dignity in Schools campaign and the National yeah. Week, Week of Action that's coming up October 21st through 29th. So before I let you go, Miriam, is there a word or two you can say about that? Absolutely. Um, there are many ways that people could get involved in um, interrupting the school or prison pipeline. I think one of the first things parents can do is to look into your school, find out what are the statistics for uh, suspension and expulsion and arrest at the school level. Get involved in your local PTA and your local parent organizations and press for restorative justice uh, responses 
instead of punitive responses to address these kinds of issues. So you can get involved at the local level that way. And then Dignity in Schools campaign has a national week of action against school push out where they are going to be talking about the criminalization of young people of all different sorts, um, including black kids, but also uh, Native American children are very disproportionately represented within the pipeline as well. Um, And they're going to be doing that, as you mentioned, from October 29th through the October 21st through the 29th. People can go to the Dignity in Schools campaign Facebook page and to their Twitter account to follow and retweet and share their own stories um, during the course of that week. There will also be events all around the country that people can attend to learn more about this issue. Well, thank you so much for your great work in this area, Mariam. Kaba, thanks for your excellent article in Teen Vogue. Again, it's available online, How the School to Prison Pipeline Works and Why Black Girls Are Particularly at Risk. And thanks, Mariam, for coming on the program. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me.